Right. So you see that we are not debating on the bank card which is done and dusted and most of you are aware of. This whole session I think was very important to, to talk about a contrary narrative here. Um, so it's important to understand something beyond the plain bony bank card. Um, you know. No? This one? Yeah. So these are the comparative CT scans where you can see that this is a normal glenoid. All three of them are dislocators. I would do an arthroscopic bank card for this patient. This one is a glenoid bone loss, and most of us will agree we would do between an open and an arthroscopic lethargy for this patient. But this is the one that often gets missed. And as Ram said, you must have a CT scan. I'm relentlessly echoing what Ram said, that a CT scan will highlight the bony bank card and it will be missed very often. Uh, the MRI is reasonably underwhelming to denote the bony bank card presence and we must pick this up very quickly, like on the x-rays, uh, if you can. There's also this discussion between is it a fracture glenoid or is it a bony bank card. So the bony bank card is something that happens after in a patient with recurrent instability. It is not related to a single trauma that the fracture glenoid is related to. And you must understand, again echoing Sanjay Garudi here, that the fragment gets devascularized and it has lost its blood supply. The labrum cannot conceivably provide adequate blood supply to that fragment. So when this patient comes back after two years and that fragment has dissolved, it's going to move into a bone loss scenario where you're going to subject a dislocator to Elataje, which is a much more grievous, bigger, dicey procedure. So if you can pick up the bony bank cards and treat them more aggressively as opposed to a conventional bank card where he can come in and meet us any such time. Classifications, uh, there are many classifications. Uh, this is the Eidberg classification for the fracture glenoid, which cannot be extrapolated to bony glenoid. And then Brigliani gave this classification for a bony glenoid long back, where he related the bone fragment to the IGHL as well. But I don't think that's of much pertinence. I think what is very important is to diagnose the bone loss. Now, you've seen three different types of instabilities. But within that bony bank art patient, there are three different ways to treat them. So if you wish, you could do a screw fixation, open, arthroscopic. There are issues about arthroscopic, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, you could do a conventional bank card and still par for the course uh, if you think you're comfortable doing that and treat it like a bank card and get the bumper back in place. Or you could do something called this a suture bridge technique, which I'll probably highlight much more so that it's kind of a double row repair of the fragment and the labrum together. And I think Peter Millet uh, described this very elegantly and started this trend for the suture bridge technique, really speaking. With this slide, just want to highlight the feature that this is a 58-year-old business lady, just fell off the stairs, and pain settled down the next day. Terribly apprehensive. She wouldn't let me touch her hand at all. And if you look at the x-ray, it looks reasonably OK, but there's something fishy going on here. And that should alert you. That's a red flag that's enough to ensure that you actually go and do a CT scan. But don't do a conventional CT scan, because the conventional CT scan is going to show this kind of, oh, it's an undisplaced fragment. Leave it be. She's 58. But she wouldn't move her hand at all. She was so incredibly, because these patients are apprehensive in the mid-range position. Till such time that you do a sagittal reconstruction of 3D reconstruction of the glenoid, ought to subtract the humerus. And these instructions have to go from you to the radiologist. He's not going to do it on his own volition. If you, have, if you had not subtracted the head of humerus, you wouldn't pick up this fragment here at all. Another lady, 62-year-old, done recently about three, three and a half months back, and again with a similar history, very apprehensive. She came to us almost six weeks later, and she says, presented like a frozen shoulder. If you look at the x-ray, some very faint red flag there, very faint. And so if you would do a CT scan, you can see well, yes, that looks like an undisplaced bony bank card. We picked it up quite right. She also came with an MRI. And that kind of vaguely reiterates the same fragment. That's a 3T MRI for you, uh, unlikely to miss out on this. And you can see there's a fragment there. Looks reasonably innocuous. Even the actual CT looks innocuous. Till you go up and do a 
3D reconstruction and then the reality hits you. So the X-ray doesn't tell you a story, the actual CT scan doesn't tell you a story, the story is on a 3D reconstruction canal. This is the same lady, you can see arthroscopically, that's my probe, that's the entire big fragment, there are chunks of loose cartilage in her. And some cartilage loss because she's 62, you can see some cartilage changes as well. And this is the final, you can see the suture bridge technique fixation and we've got the bumper and the fragment in. But this surgery is uh, multiple times more difficult, complex, and you need to be really diligent on doing a bony bank art, as opposed to a bank art, which is going to be pretty straightforward for most of you guys here. And then, as Ram said, we must do a CT scan, like Karthik's case, he said all his latages, they did a follow-up CT scan after three months, six months, and you should see that there's a nice reconstruction to the native glenoid, and that does reconstruct beautifully. This is another patient, you can see between the pre-op, post-op CT scan difference, you can see the anchor channels there, and you, it's important to restore the dish. If you don't give that natural hollow to the glenoid, that head is not going to sit in place and will be a problem here. Now, we've observed that most of our bony pancart patients, not all, but most of them, are usually elderly ladies with osteoporotic bones. The bones are much more weaker than the ligament, and the bones will give. And the others are the post bankart failures. If you have a post bankart failure, this, the anchor line appears like the fatigue line, and then invariably the glenoid will fracture through that line. This is one of the few studies, there are very few studies focused on the bony bank art, but this was Joshua Giles, where 16 specimen cadaveric did a biomechanical study and found no difference in load contact between a point fixation and a double row fixation. However, in the initial fixation stent, the, it was statistically significant that on the eccentric loading, the double row suture bridge repair was much more resolute, stronger, enduring than the single point fixation. This is a brief animation of the procedure, what I'm trying to do. Principally, I want you to understand, it's much better understood on the graphic than on the live surgery, that because this is a double row, the medial anchor has to go far medial, and that's a double-loaded anchor on the medial side. And this is an elegant technique because it doesn't involve passing sutures through the fragment because the fragment tends to be very fragile, and it can disrupt if you start penetrating that fragment. So this is your lateral position, this is the fragment. Uh, your first anchor is going to come through much more medial right there, and that's precarious because that path is straight in front of the brachial plexus and kissing the axillary nerve. So you must be very comfortable do, going into that area and not um, going in blindly. So if you have never been near the axillary nerve, you are not sure about the anatomy, then best to do this as open surgery and you can still do a double row uh, repair. Once you've done that, all you have to do is retrieve the sutures underneath the labrum bony fragment complex, and that's it. That's the most tough part. Once this is done, it doesn't involve passing any sutures. You're just going to tie the medial row down to uh, the medial row to the lateral row, and that's going to be like a pulley technique, so it will just help sit the fragment down beautifully. Uh, Tikshit, can you just forward that video for me on my behalf? So then we have two anchors coming in here on the, that's fine, thank you. On the edge, native edge, uh, at the fracture edge actually, not the native edge, and then you pick up one set and tie it up with the other set and then pick up the lower set for the upper fibers and the upper set for the low fibers. And that way you achieve a nice crisscross suture bridge repair and it just puts down the fragment with high fidelity back into its own position. It just, there is no passing sutures or indirect shuttle technique here at all. And as long as you've got that medial anchor safe, then you're good for. We'll press ahead now. So in the final picture, this is how it looks. You can see that it's a very strong repair, and you've got the fragment in place. And because it's like an open reduction, it's a, a nice, uh, robust fixation there. Now, this is the point I want to highlight. Whether you do it arthroscopic, whichever technique you do, if you're going to put in your medial anchor, your medial anchor is going to come straight, right close to that brachial plexus. And it's a far medial. It's like the medial port of arthrolatage. So it's right down to the nipple, and so be very careful about that. I have not mentioned about uh, Sugaya's technique, but Sugaya does it in a very elegant manner in a different technique, where he has a bone stitcher, which is patented technology for him, and he passes it through the fragment. And so here he's getting a bone-to-bone -bone reduction and fixation, and that's also possible. And he's shown uh, six months, one year down the line, that the whole glenoid would reconstruct itself back to its native position. 
So in conclusion, I think the priority uh, is bony bank art fractures. Don't treat them casually. They look innocent. You need to do a CT. These are different uh, cases. It's a different animal completely. You could do an open fixation. You could do a double row repair. You can do a direct repair. It doesn't matter. And if you're doing arthroscopic medial anchor, then you have to be very careful that it's not going into the nerve or the brachial plexus. And the last point is to evaluate the results and to know how safe that patient is, please do a CT scan three months or six months down the line. Thank you very much. You, I think we are open to take some questions for the previous session to any of the faculty. So if you can come in forward, there are mics in the aisles. We can come in and address your questions. Till such time that people ask questions, can I ask Karthik? Um, your post-op CT scans for your Lataje, at what time interval were they done? Can you have a cordless mic from Karthik? So we did, we did the CT scans uh, anywhere between six to nine months. Right. So uh, initially we were not very particular, but then later we actually made it sure that all the patient got a CT at six to nine months and then we allowed them to return back to sport after confirming sure. healing of the... Sure. So that's largely to confirm healing of the, yeah. um, the fixation sure uh, because osteolysis would set in a year later actually. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. Just confirm healing and it's part of another study where we are looking at our technique to put the uh, graft in position and make sure that the graft is really in position whether it's medial or lateral. Right. Sure. We have some questions at the back end first, then we'll come to Vishwadeep later. Uh, good morning, Dr. Ashish. Uh, the, my first question would be to you that you told uh, how to manage a bony bank art lesion, but I believe most of these cases were fresh cases. So sometimes you come across patients who, are, uh, who come with a bony chunk which has united uh, with the glenoid, but has united uh, going down and below. Now, uh, how do you deal with them? You try to erase them, or now you just reconstruct the face of the glenoid and see whether there's a significant bone loss? Identical technique. Identical. They never unite. It's a fibrous union. Okay. So it, you treat them like an alpsa. Go and use a blunt perio or a blunt elevator. Lift the fragment off and pull it back in place. And it works. If you've seen a fragment there, it's viable. Okay. Thank you. This way. Vishwadeep. Yeah, my question is to Karthik. In his study, he said that few of the cases he did uh, uh, lethargy for patients who were high demand laborers or contact uh, athletes, uh, but they didn't have a significant bone loss. By that, you mean that probably they had bone loss less than 20%. So here we are talking about not doing lethargy for these patients, but I wanted to know that at another study, what did you see that whether uh, there was lysis of the graft. What was the pattern of lysis? As uh, Dr. Ram said, that the lysis is usually in the superior part. But in your study, what did you feel? Is your personal experience? So this, uh, calculating lysis was not part of the study, but uh, it's part of another study which is going on. I agree, but yeah. I wanted your comment what, on that. What we actually see is in some of these patients, actually there was no lysis at all. The, uh, it's, uh, we're, we're soon going to come but up But you do lethargy in the I'm, I'm same way. Just, yeah, I'm just coming there. So these were normal glenoids, 100% glenoid. There was no glenoid bone loss. So we are always talking about Wolf's law, where if, the, if we put extra bone on the glenoid, it's going to resolve. But to our surprise, in, in some of our patients, we've got about 20 patients who got a CT at one and a half to two years' time, and we are still seeing good glenoid graft sitting there and the surface area has increased to about 120 to 130 percent. And I don't know whether this will lie because we see a solid union, the glenoid is actually bigger than his normal native glenoid. And he had a normal glenoid to start with, there was no bone loss, and he has actually, the bone has actually incorporated well. Probably that glenoid is, that graft is being stressed by this patient because he's got an extra demand there, so he actually needed more glenoid there. So we do see lysis, but there are some patients who actually we haven't seen lysis at all. So it is not a rule that if you do a, a latage on a normal glenoid that will always lyse. It's not a rule, at least to, in my personal experience. Thank you. We'll move on. At the back end. Uh, good morning. I'd like to ask Dr. Moya how he treats patients who have partial or small full thickness cuff tears with 
some with restricted motion, some with full range of motion, because we get these patients and the, they've been to someone who's advised arthroscopic surgery, but the patient is reluctant, but consists, uh, gets persistent pain. How do you deal with these? So, <clears throat> you mean patients with rotator cuff tears, but no glenohumeral instability? No instability, partial or full thickness tears, mm -hmm. some with restricted movement, some with full movement, some who have done physio, some who have been advised surgery, but they are, they are not agreeing for surgery, but they have persistent pain. Mm -hmm. Well, we are moving to the rotator cuff session, but anyways, uh, it's up to many variables. Uh, I should consider the patient's age. If, if I have a full thickness rotator cuff tear in an 80 years old patient, I don't generally go ahead with surgery. I must consider which is the source of pain. For instance, if this 80 years old patient has a biceps tendon that is still there and is degenerated uh, and I do not get good results with conservative treatment, I go ahead with the biceps tenotomy in those patients. Uh, with partial tears, it, it's also up. It's, it's a very wide question. It's also up to the patient's age, to the what happened with the rehab, if it's uh, the size of the partial tear, some partial tears in very active patients are a good indication for surgery from the beginning. In other patients with a small tear, a small partial tear, and uh, not very active patients, we prefer to give all the chance to the rehab. <clears throat> what I can tell you about the rehab is that following Rockwood, we prefer supervised home-based rehab programs that they are very good, uh, they are very successful, and we as surgeons um, are taking care and supervising the rehab program. So generally what I do is to <clears throat> try to give all the opportunity to the rehab program, except in young patients in which I move uh, faster to surgery. Uh, you need to recover range of motion, uh, it, that's the first the first point is to, Rockwood used to say, uh, to control pain, second, recover range of motion, third, to recover strength, and fourth, to maintain the exercise for a long time uh, after uh, receive, uh, having a good result. Hmm? Raj, we, can, thank you. Yeah. It would be nice to have pertinent questions related to the session going on. Thank you. Right. Shashank, last two questions. Are patients ready? We've got a lovely, juicy, subscap tear, JCU. Yes, Shashank. My question is for Karthik. Uh, Karthik, uh, you made a very interesting point, but maybe because of lack of time, you could not elaborate on it. How does Alpha and Bankard differ in prognosis, and what does it do to your treatment strategy? So um, there have been studies previously published on this. The, so we know that Alpha is probably a, a late sequence of a Bankard, or in some cases, we do see uh, an alpha lesion in a, in a fresh patient as well. So the severity of injury is more and the quality of labrum is bad. So if you treat this alpha patient as, a, as, uh, as you treat a normal patient with a normal sort of good juicy labrum, the results have been shown to be poor. So in fact, some authors uh, suggest doing a LATAJ in these patients. But what we've done is we've, we designed on LATAJ preoperatively. We don't uh, make an interoperative decision of LATAJ. So when we go in and we find a poor quality labrum, we want to supplement it with something else. So even if the patient doesn't have an off-track Hillsack lesion, we still do a rumplissage in this patient, just hoping that this will be more like an insurance policy, you know, avoiding failure because of the poor quality labor. So basically you're saying ABSA is a little more dangerous, so add yes. rumplissage as a routine if you if you diagnose this yes. payoff? Yes. Okay. And the one more is... Shashank, oh. we'll come back to it. Yes, last question. Uh, sir, my question is for uh, Ashish sir, Karthik sir, and Garude sir. Is there any indication for doing a latter J and a ramp research? Never in my experience, uh, never in uh, some of the proponents of latter J, but Karthik and Sanjay, your. I've had one case, a 75 year old gentleman who had a neglected locked anterior dislocation who had a very big hill sack lesion. I did an open latter J and an open ramp on him. 
just to be sure. So I had a seizure patient with the same problem. I just wanted to get your opinion. Yeah. And he did well. I, I was yeah. worried about his rotation and all that, but he did same. Well. Yeah. Garudi, sir? I think if you're doing a good Lataje, that uh, Hillsax is not really going to come into the picture any longer. So at least I have personally never ever done it. Uh, the, it has been described in literature, but I do think sincerely that it's a bit of an overkill. Okay. Yeah, thank you, sir. If you survive the day, we might have a nice case similar for you at the end of the day. Okay. So thank stick you. along. Uh, let me invite Dave and Sundarajan to chair the next session. We have a live surgery, arthrosopic subscapular stair, and JC has a lifetime work on subscap. He's reinvented the subscap, so he's the best person to teach us about the in, in the box, outside the box technique. So. Be wrapped up. Over to you. Hello.